What a beautiful day. <clears throat> what a beautiful day. See, I'm all choked up. I can't even talk now. <clears throat> what a uh, what a wonderful season you guys are in right now. You are you're in a new season. You've got a new guy coming next week, amen? A lot of you are going to go load him up and bring him here. What a sign of love that you're showing to this new guy coming. Uh, we've been praying for you guys. We are excited for you, and I know you are excited too, because a new season brings on new opportunity to reach out to some people maybe who have not come here in a while and to find new people. That has absolutely nothing to do with my message today, but I wanted to share that. <laughs> We're going to continue in Philippians chapter 3 um, this week. And uh, do you all recognize these characters? Where, where did they come from? Dr. Seuss. Exactly. Thing one, thing two. So, several years ago, I took my son and a, and a friend of his to the Perot Museum in downtown Dallas. Anybody ever been to the Perot Museum? Anybody at all? A few people have? I'm telling you, even as an adult, you can go there. It is a blast. There is so much to learn, so much to do. It's interactive, and we had a great time. And during, during our walkthrough of the museum, there was a, we were in one exhibit area, and I noticed a kid wearing a red shirt with a white circle, and it said, Thing 3. Well, in that same, same exhibit area, I, I saw another kid wearing a red shirt with a white circle, and it said, Thing 4. And then I saw another one. It said, Thing 2. And I saw another one. It said, Thing one, and I'm going, what is going on here? I'm not thinking about Dr. Seuss. I'm thinking we missed an exhibit somewhere that we were supposed to wear a red shirt or something of that nature. Where can I buy one of these? And then, then I saw a woman pushing a stroller, and she had a, a baby in her, in her arms, and she, picked, she was laying the baby down into the, the stroller, and it too had a red shirt on, that said thing five. And when she laid the baby in the stroller and she, she, she stood up, she had a red shirt on with a white circle. And it said, Mom of all things. And I thought, well, how cool is this woman? Okay? She's taken her kids to the museum and she doesn't want to lose them. So we're going to put them in a red shirt with a theme on it. And if they get lost, everyone in the museum knows where to take them. <laughs> to the mom of all things. Well, this morning, uh, we're going to continue in Philippians. If you remember last week, uh, we, we got hung up on the word mature in verse 15. And today, we're going to get hung up on another word. It's at the end of verse 15 in Philippians chapter 3. And it says, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. Which begs the question, what things? Well, in order for us to determine what things Paul is talking about, we have to back it up several verses. So we're going to back it up this morning and begin in verse 4, the second half of verse 4. And Paul Paul breaks down these things into three categories. He, and it's really more of, a, uh, more of a, uh, a testimony, I guess, for Paul. Uh, you know, a lot of times when Paul's writing these letters, he's confronted with, uh, uh, he's confronted with some things that uh, maybe some people are attacking him, and he feels like he has to defend himself. And so a lot of times we see all defending himself in certain ways. And this morning, we kind of see that as he talks about his past, he's going to talk to us about his present, 
and he's going to also talk to us about his, his future. But really, he's talking to us about a bunch of things this morning. And so let's look at and try to break this down a little bit. Uh, and starting in verse 4, he says, If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day. Now, hopefully, y'all got one of these sheets. Does everybody have one? Excellent, because these will be graded at the end of today. We're going to turn those in. There's a basket out in the foyer. I saw it. Uh, you can put that in there anyway. We're going to try to write down these things that Paul is talking about. And the very first one, this is not the word, but the very first thing that he says is, that he was circumcised on the eighth day. Now, why is that important? Because every Jewish male, by law, had to be circumcised, not on the fifth day, or the sixth day, or the ninth day, but on the eighth day. So Paul is laying out, and this is the word to write down, he's laying out his credentials. And the thing that I, I want to mention right now is these things that are in Paul's past, he says in verse 7, whatever the things that were gains to me, I now consider loss. So keep in mind as we're talking about these things in the past, these are things that Paul says have no value without Christ. And the first thing that he talks about is his credentials. As we continue to read, he says, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, <clears throat> Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. What, what's, he, what's he saying here? Uh, I mean, what does that mean to me? I mean, I understand credentials, even though, you know, we don't really talk about uh, circumcised on the eighth day, but now he's saying, of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. That's who Paul is. But what is he saying to us? How does that... How does that thing line up in, in our language today? Well, if I said, if I use the name Kennedy or Rockefeller or Bush, you would identify with that heritage, would you not? Paul, and that's the word to write down, is Paul is talking about his heritage. <clears throat> and a lot of times it's, it's your name. I went to a church... Uh, I hope y'all don't get tired of my stories, but I went to a church one time, and uh, it was the first time I'd, I'd gone to this church, and I, I walked in, and I was going to shake the guy's hand, and the guy walked up to meet me, and, and I said, hi, I'm, I'm Ron Ansel, and he said, good morning, Ron, my name's Ardell Christian, this is my wife, Catherine, we're the only Christians in the church. I never forgot him. <laughs> I'm not sure he was correct, <laughs> but he was the only one with the name Christian. In the church, y'all with me? But Paul is talking about his heritage. You know, regardless of what your name is, what Paul's saying is, is I'm the, I'm the poster child for the Jewish people, and I find no value in, in my heritage. He goes on to list a third thing. He says, in regard to the law of Pharisee. You see, there's four groups in the, in the, in the, Jewish, in the Jewish world, and one of those groups is a Pharisee. And the Pharisees were known for studying the law. They were experts in the law, and, and Paul was a student, and he studied under the most important people in the Jewish world, and he was, and recognizes himself right here in regard to the law, a Pharisee. He's very proud of that. Well, how, how would we equate that today? Simply this, it's education. It's education, and he's saying my education has no value. I give up my education. He says, in Christ, without Christ, it has no value. When I decided to uh, go back to school at Dallas Christian and finish that Bible degree I started in 1979, I, was, uh, I went to the campus and I was walking down the, the hallway and there were some professors out there talking and I thought, well, this is a great opportunity for me to maybe I could schmooze them a little bit, you know. I might need some help coming back at such a late age in life and so I just jumped in on the conversation and introduced myself and told them who I was, and we 
had a nice conversation, and they said, well, Ron, why, why now? Why come back now? So I, 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 I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm wrapping up a, a secular career, and uh, I just I feel called to, to go into full-time ministry, but one of the, the realities is I can't do spiritual work without worldly credentials. And, and they said, yeah, that's true. You should teach here. <laughs> and I'm thinking, no, <laughs> that's not where I was going with that. But isn't it true? Sometimes we just think in terms of the world, and we don't really apply what is spiritual. And that's what Paul is trying to convey here in terms of credentials and heritage and education. And let's look at the fourth thing that he presents to us as something that's of no value without Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he says, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Like I said, Paul is the poster child for Israel. And what he says is this. Without Christ, none of it has value. And the fourth word that he's given us right here is he's given us his resume. Is that not what that is? As for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on law, he's faultless. I mean, if you think about it, Paul was given letters by the, by the uh, Jewish leaders, and these letters authorized him to do what? Persecute Christians. You can go kill them. It's okay. We're going to give you a letter. You're fine. Like I said, Paul was the man. And what he says in verse 7 as we move forward into the next, next section, he says, but whatever my gains were, because those were of value to him, were they not? I mean, he worked hard to get himself to that level. <clears throat> and, and he says, whatever my gains were, I now consider them loss for the sake of Christ. So some of the things that he's talking about in verse uh, 15, he's listed as his past, and he's saying, those things don't matter. They don't mean anything. And now he's in the present. And as we look at the things in the present, um, we're going to find the things that do have value. <clears throat> let's mo keep moving in uh, verses 7. We've read, let's for, pick up in verse 8. What is more, I consider everything a loss, we've, we've, we've mentioned that, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. And the word to write down, first of all, things that have value, is the word no. That's what he said. I've given up all of this for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. To know Christ. You, we're sitting, we, you guys know each other. I see you when we get here, you talk to one another, you hug one another, you shake hands with one another, you drink coffee with one another. You, you know each other, but do you really know each other? Do you know what the person in front of you is thinking? Do you really know them? Some of you might. Most of us don't. We don't really know somebody that well. And this is an intimate knowing Paul is talking about, to know Christ. Uh, let's look at the second thing that he talks about. In fact, he goes so far as to say, I consider them garbage. Uh, your, 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 your version might say refuse. Uh, but he considers them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. The word is gain. What value is it? To gain Christ. That's the second thing that he's talking about. And the third, as we continue to read, he says <clears throat> in verse 10, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. And just for a, a moment, and, 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 and wow, what a wonderful job, uh, we, uh, what a wonderful message we had 
in the communion this morning again as a reminder. And, and here's what Paul was saying right here, participation in the sufferings. That's what we kind of talked about last week, was our suffering. Now, Paul wanted to suffer as Christ, not, not to, to the degree that way, but he would have been pro- fine with that probably. But he's saying we need to participate in that and to know the power of his resurrection. And more importantly, he says, becoming like him in his death. Now, when I, when I read that, I think to myself, was that literal? Did Paul want to become like Christ in his death? Did he want to be hung on the cross? I don't think that's what he's talking about. I think what he's talking about is just to become, how do we become like Christ in his death? How do we do that? Well, that takes us to a few passages of Scripture that are not on the slide, so if you have your Bible, I hope you'll, you'll open it to uh, Romans. If you would, Romans. <clears throat> Chapter 13. There's a passage here that <clears throat> kind of alludes to what Paul is talking about. He says, after he lists a whole bunch of sins, Okay, he says, this is not how you need to behave. He says, but rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. He says to clothe yourself. Well, what does that mean, to clothe yourself? Well, if you would, flip over to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, that's not on your slide. <clears throat> Open up your Bible app or your Bible, whatever you have. Galatians chapter 3, he he defines what that means. He says in verse 26, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. How do we become like Christ in his death? Well, when we are buried in baptism. That's how, and that's what he says. So the third word to write down in our, in our sheet here is wear. We must wear Christ. That's what Paul's talking about here. So <clears throat> three things that, that are valuable that Paul is talking about is to know Christ and to gain Christ and to wear Christ. What's the fourth one? The fourth one he continues to say in verse 11, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Well, we're not going to be, we're not going to die. I don't know anybody who has died that has come back to life, personally. In fact, we have the only Savior of all the gods in the world, we have the only Savior that has come back to life. Have you thought about that? Amen? We don't see Muhammad, we don't see Buddha, we don't see... They didn't come back to life. They died. They're dead. Jesus Christ, he rose from the grave, amen? That's right. And so what Paul is talking about is here is a Savior who is alive, which is our fourth word. The fourth thing of value is to live Christ. <clears throat> I'm sorry about this sore throat or, or whatever it is I've got. It just it just creeped up this morning. Actually, when we were singing that song, <laughs> so maybe I was singing too loud. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and so there we there we have <clears throat> there we have the uh, the four things that he says that do have that do have value. Now, let's try to wrap this up and and look at. Uh, the last part of this verse, last part of this lesson. <clears throat> because what Paul does is, thank you, yeah, that'd be awesome. What Paul does is he, uh, he moves into the future. We looked at the past, and now we're moving into the future. Past, present, and future. Reminds me of a Michael J. Fox movie. But anyway, <clears throat> thank you for the water. Let's look at verse 12. Not that I have already obtained. 
all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Now, as I'm reading that sentence, the thing that jumps out at me is, well, what is, what is the that? Let's look at it again. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Well, what is that? Why did Jesus take hold of Paul? What was the motivation? What did he want to do? What was his purpose? He wanted to save him, didn't he? Paul was going down the wrong path, and he wanted to save him. Why, why does he take hold of you? Because he wants to save you. That's it. So as we look at the first line on that, on that sheet, the word is hold. Take hold and with purpose. And that's what Paul's saying. And the best analogy, the best story I can think of is how many of you have, have fed a baby in your arms? A lot of you have. Okay, so now when you take that baby in your arms and you have that baby right here, okay, and then you have this bottle, right? You take that bottle and you put that in the baby's mouth, right? So you're, you took hold of the bottle, right? You put that in the baby's mouth. If that baby's arms are free, what's it going to do? It's going to take hold of that bottle, isn't it? Why? In that moment, you see, in that moment, what's happened is you, in an attempt to save that baby, to nourish that baby, to feed that baby, and to love that baby, and that baby has joined you because that baby wants to be fed. That baby wants to be nourished. That baby wants to be loved. That, that baby wants to be saved. Are you with me? And that's what Paul is saying right here is, I want to take hold of that, that Jesus Christ took hold of me. And that's what he's saying right there. Now, he, he, he also talks about in verse 12, he says that uh, I haven't arrived at the goal yet. So he hadn't achieved it yet. He has to keep going, right? And he also says that uh, I press on to toward the goal to win the what? The prize. How many of us like prizes? I used to buy Cracker Jacks just for the prize. Yeah, there were prizes in Cracker Jacks. Maybe there still are. I have no idea. And then, and then they started doing something amazing. Kellogg's decided we were going to put a prize in a cereal box. Oh, yeah, Mom, I love that cereal. I hate that cereal, but I want the prize. We all like prizes, don't we? And our, and our second word here is the prize that Paul is alluding to, the, the prize that we are all trying to get to, that he was trying to get to, and that is heaven. It's heaven. That's the prize. So... Why, why do things have value? Well, <clears throat> purpose to take hold of. And we all want to get to heaven. You know, a, a bigger question might be, we've gone through all that fairly quickly this morning, and why? Why, why does Paul take us down this road of things in the past that don't have any value and things that do have value? And if you think about what Paul has really done here is he has, He's made a trade. He's made an exchange. He has traded his things of no value for something of real value. Are you with me? Do we all like to make a good trade? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and so, but, but why? Why is, why is all this? Why do, we, why do we look at this? Why does Paul want us to go down this road? Let me tell you why. It's one word, and, and y'all will, will be able to figure this out on your own, but it's one word. And God, he looks down from heaven and he sees us. And he misses us, you see, because we have sin. And he says, you know, I really want a relationship with him. But I can't have that. I can't have a relationship with my children because they're in sin and I can't have sin. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my son, who I love, I'm going to send him down there to them. 
and he's going to show them how to live, how to behave, and then he's going to die for them. He's going to be the sacrifice. And he's going to do that because he loves me and he loves them. Christ does that. What happens to us? We now have the opportunity to have a relationship with our God. And now God's pretty happy. I now can love my children. I've always loved them, but now they can love me back. So the word is love. And that's the whole point of everything that Paul is talking about here, is that he loves us. God loves us, and because of that, we shouldn't be chasing worldly things. What we should be chasing is things of spiritual value. And that's what he's trying to tell us here in the things that he's mentioning. Because remember, what we started was all of us who then are mature should take such a view of things. And that's what he's talking about. If you would, pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we are so grateful, so grateful, Lord, for your word. Lord, that as we read it, we know that this is how you speak to us, or one way you speak to us today. And we pray, Father, that somehow this morning your spirit has been at work, and that somehow, Lord, our heart has been touched, that ears have been pricked, Lord, and that uh, your word is on somebody's mind and heart. We thank you, Father, for your love, and it's only because of your love that, that we, have, we have grace. And we are thankful for that, Lord. Help us, Lord, each and every day to look for ways to serve you, to work beyond the world, and to work, Lord, within your spirit. Thank you for all you do for us, Lord. You bless us greatly, more than we deserve. And we thank you and praise you. In Christ's name, amen.